Over the last couple of centuries, as humans have been moving around the world in much greater numbers, we've also seen a huge increase in the number of other species that have been moving around um, the planet. And we can really look at this. Hawaii is a great place to look at this because Hawaii is so isolated, as you can see from this map, from any other landmass, and we can really see um, how species arrived there. So looking at Hawaii, if we go back to when they first um, came up out of the ocean about five million years ago, um, until the time when humans first arrived in about 400 AD, about one species arrived in Hawaii about every 35,000 years. After the Polynesians arrived in the year 400 about, that rate increased to about one species every, every 30 years, or about 1,000 times faster. The Europeans first arrived in Hawaii in 1778, and since then, the rates increased even more to about four plant species arriving every year, and these are just ones that establish and are able to spread. About 10 times that many species actually arrive in Hawaii and are planted in gardens but, but don't escape. So as um, I mentioned, species have been moving even long distances to Hawaii without human, um, without human help for a long time. And for species such as birds or flying insects, it's really obvious how they can move around. But even for plants, there are many species that, of plants that are adapted for really long distance uh, movement. So a couple of examples, the coconut. Um, the coconut can germinate after floating in the ocean for at least 110 days, which gives it the capacity to travel long distances and colonize new areas. Fireweed is a plant with small seeds. Um, that can float in the air. They've been found hundreds of meters up in the air, and it's estimated that they routinely travel 100 to 300 kilometers from where they started. So species can move long distances on their own without help from humans. And in fact, this is really important because it's only in this way that, that species can colonize new areas. So for example, when Mount St. Helens in Washington State erupted in 1980, a huge area of land was completely destroyed and covered with um, sterilized pumice and ash. No species survived. For this place to recover, species had to travel from outside and make it there. Scientists over the next decades have been studying this and, and watching this process um, happen. And it is happening, although it's often quite slow. So as you can see from this series of photos taken from the same location over time, very, very slowly, we see the colonization of plant species. This picture from 18 years after the eruption, we do see there are plants there, but there's still a lot of bare ground. But without this ability to move long distances, a place like this would remain bare. On a larger scale, 20,000 years ago, Connecticut and most of North, northern North America was covered by ice. So there were no species, or very few species, present here in Connecticut at that time. Oaks, which are one of the most common tree species in Connecticut, were restricted to the southeastern United States, as shown in this map. At the end of the Ice Age, as things started to warm, oaks started to move northward, and the ice retreated. Oaks arrived in Connecticut a little more than 11,000 years ago, and have since reached to the northern border of the United States. This ability of species to move in response to changing climate is incredibly important, and will be in even more important over the next decades and centuries as we change the climate in, um, in increasing ways. Species will need to be able to continue to move in response to that climate. They'll need to be able to move towards the poles, they'll need to be able to move upward in elevation to be able to find areas um, that they can live. For example, um, a mountain such as Mount Baker in Washington State, as the temperature increases, the ice will melt and species will need to move upwards. The question is, will they be able to move fast enough? Many species likely will, but research from this mountain and others has showed that some species move incredibly slowly and may not actually be able to respond fast enough to respond to climate change. So given that species are always moving and that we need them to move, should we be concerned about the fact that many, many more species are moving around in the last couple hundred years than previously? Well, there's three reasons, at least, why we should be concerned. The first is simply the magnitude of it. So to give you an example, in Connecticut, um, in 1910, there were about 
just under 500 species present, plant species present in Connecticut that had um, been brought here since European colonization. That was about 22% of the total number of plant species. By 2014, that number had more than doubled to 1,082 species that had, been, that had come in from outside of the state, making up about 38% um, of the total number of plant species. That means that more than a third of the species of plants we have in Connecticut now weren't here when Europeans colonized. They've been brought in since European colonization. Now second, even though the majority of those species remain fairly uncommon, they don't have much of an impact, some species, which are able to escape their predators, they're able to escape um, competitors where they natively grow, they become extremely abundant, spread rapidly, and have major impacts on the native species and, and um, ecosystems. These are called invasive species. The invasive species may outcompete or eat um, native species, leading to declines and extinctions in the native um, plants and animals. They may also change the environment in a way that makes it less likely for the native species to be able to survive. Now, to give you an idea of the numbers here, of those little over a thousand species of plants in Connecticut that were not here prior to European colonization, only about 50 are officially listed as an invasive species, and about 50 more are potentially invasive because they've been causing problems elsewhere. So not every species is having an impact, but some of them are, and the impacts can be great, as we'll mention in um, a few moments. The third potential reason why we should be concerned is that as species move around, the ecosystems become more similar to each other as you go around the world. To illustrate this, um, the tree, tree of heaven, which is native to Eastern Asia, has since spread to the rest of Asia, Europe, North America, South America, Australia, and many islands. I've personally seen it in places as, as diverse as New Mexico, Washington State, Connecticut, Italy. As we go to these different places, we're now seeing environments and ecosystems that are much more similar than they used to be. Now, these invasive species are potentially problematic. We want to be careful, though, not to um, make moral judgment on species simply because of their origin. But we do need to do something about it to, um, to reduce those impacts. So what do we do? How do we, well, first of all, how are they getting here, right? What are the ways that these species move? And what impacts do they have? Let me give some examples. All right, many species are actually intentionally brought for a particular purpose. So I'm gonna give a few examples of plants, but obviously animals, fungi, viruses, um, all types of organisms are moved. So the first example is autumn olive. This is a species from Asia that arrived in North America in 1830, and um, it was intentionally used to provide food for wildlife and to, for erosion control. As late as the 1950s, government publications were still advocating planting this widespread. It's since spread from Maine to Wisconsin, south to Arkansas, and to Florida, and can get as dense as 50,000 plants per acre, meaning that nothing else essentially can grow um, in, those, in those areas. It also adds nitrogen to the soil, which makes the areas more suitable for other invasives and less suitable for native species. Species have often also been brought um, for ornamental purposes, either as pets or um, to plant in gardens. And an example of this is burning bush, which is commonly planted um, here in Connecticut and many other places because of its great fall color, as you can see in this picture. Um, burning bush, again, came from Asia in the 1800s. And it still um, makes about $38 million in revenue in the United States being sold in nurseries. It spreads easily into forests, um, outcompetes native plants, and causes significant problems. But because it makes a lot of money, it still is being sold despite being listed in the invasive species list in 21 states. Many species are introduced accidentally. This happens in many ways. Insects are often um, brought in in, the, in um, packing crates or their packing materials. Snakes have been known to get into the, the wheel wells of planes and be transported from, from place to place. Aquatic organisms attach to boats and are carried around the world. And seeds of plants 
are often contaminants in seed, in straw, or on people's boots, or socks, or cars, um, and can be moved around a lot. So one example of this is cheatgrass. Cheatgrass also arrived in the 1800s, probably as a contaminant in wheat that was moved around. Um, it also gets moved around really easily in socks. When I was growing up, this was a, one of my least favorite plants because it was always got caught in my socks. Um, but as you can see from this picture, it can become very dense. And it also, in the summertime, dries out and becomes very flammable. So areas that have been invaded by cheatgrass have many more fires. Those fires lead to changing from a shrubland of native species to a grassland of invasive species. So these species that are um, introduced can have significant impacts, and they get here in a, a wide variety of ways. So what do we do about that? Well, there's a lot of ways to try and approach this. None of them is fully effective, and so we have to try a variety. So I'm going to highlight a few different things that can be done to try and deal with invasive species. The first one is prevention. If we can prevent a species from moving to a new place, it can't become invasive. So these pictures illustrate one way, and that is um, really trying to scan and find these species as they accidentally are being moved. The picture on the right shows a snake-sniffing dog that's been trained to find snakes. Um, this is in the Pacific Islands where they're trying to keep snakes from getting to islands where there are no snakes already occurring. On the left, we see an agricultural inspector looking at cut plants being brought into the United States, checking to see if there are insects or fung fungi or seeds of other plants that might be hitchhiking along. Another approach to preventing invasive species is to try and figure out which species are likely to become invasive and not allow those for the horticulture or the pet trade. But sometimes we're not able to prevent a species from getting in. So the next step would be to detect those invasions early on and respond quickly. In the early stages of an invasion when the species is not very common, it's easy to eradicate them if you can find them. But finding them is often the, um, the trick. And so if we can figure out where those species are most likely to occur, that can help us focus our efforts to find them in the areas where they're likely to occur. So to give you an example from my own work, Olympic National Park is a large national park a couple hours outside of Seattle. It includes um, a wide variety of terrain, in including very remote mountains. The staff at the National Park started to notice invasive plant species moving in, and they were concerned about their ability to find these species and er eradicate them rapidly because of the great amount of area and the, and the um, limited staff that they had. So they asked me to come and see if I could predict where those species were most likely to occur. Well, how do you do that? Um, the approach that I used, um, and let me just pause here, the species that I was looking at here is English ivy. This is a species that's in the northwest, highly invasive. It was present around the park and in a few places in the park. So this picture shows an area along a trail about a mile from the nearest road um, where ivy is completely covering all the native vegetation um, back in the, in the middle of the woods in Olympic National Park. So what I did is I looked at where was English ivy occurring in and around the park? And what are the environments in which it was already occurring? And that's represented by these maps on the left-hand side of the screen here. Using a model, I could then create or a map of what habitats are very similar to where the species already occurs. And that's represented by this map on the right-hand side. So areas that are darker on that map are environments that are similar to where the species already occurs, and therefore more likely to be places where it will spread to in the future. Um, you could do this in a few different ways, coming up with different models. And if you combine them all, you can get an invasion risk map, such as this one. The darker red colors indicate areas at higher risk of invasion, mostly along the coasts and in the river valleys. The light colors indicate areas with low invasion risk, mostly in the mountains. So the park staff could use this to focus their efforts to find the species in those areas at higher risk of invasion. Well, we don't always catch the invasions before they get big. So the next approach is to try to reduce the spread of a species once it's got here. You may have seen signs like this along lakes or other hiking trails. Um, 
because a huge part of reducing spread is an individual um, responsibility. We need to check our boats, check our boots, check our cars. Especially if we're going to a natural area with no invasive species, we want to make sure that we're not taking them in with us. And then finally, when invasive species are really abundant, we have to try to control them in some way. This can be done manually, although that's very time intensive and very expensive. It can be done mechanically or with pesticides or herbicides, which is easier but has other impacts on the environment. Or we can potentially try and use um, what's called biological control or species that eat that invasive species and bring them in. Although we have to be extremely cautious to make sure that if we're bringing in yet another species, we're not causing another invasive. So there's many different ways to try and deal with um, invasive species. None of them works perfectly in every situation. But we have a toolbox of uh, potential uh, methods. So to conclude, species are always moving. They're always on the move. And we need them to be. That's how life persists on the Earth. But as humans, we're doing this at a much higher rate. We're moving things around at a much higher rate. And we need to be really careful about what we're doing because there's often unintended consequences. We need to think ahead and recognize that moving a species around right now may have impacts for generations in the future. Thank you. <laughs>